Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Chrono Play's Old Ass Games. But this one's not that old of a game. It is a fourth generation console released in 1989 in the United States. It is the Turbo Graphics 16, as you can see on the box right there. And it was the first console that was donated to the arcade side of the museum. And I found it pretty interesting when I was doing research on it and when I was, you know, opening up the box for the first time. I had never had a Turbo Graphics when I was young. I had heard that it had existed, and I the people that had it always seemed to be fairly pleased with it, but I had never played with one. So this was the first time I actually ever got to see one and open it and look at the box, and I thought it was a pretty interesting console. It looks unusual with its extension back here, and I can see why it was. And yeah, it just struck me as really odd how it was designed. I took a look at it the first time. There is one controller port, just one, no more. Because I was looking around, I'm like, why, wait, what? Yeah, there's only one controller port in this thing. When previous consoles had two or even four controller ports, it struck me as a little odd that was or there was only one in here. We have the power switch on the front, which, you know, it's just on-off switch. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. On the side, we have an antenna switch. It's actually labeled antenna switch. It is one of the standard RCA jacks that go to an antenna switch. We have a channel 3, channel 4 selector beside it. We have a power adapter on the back. And then we have this giant expansion port that I thought was a little interesting for two reasons. One, it was ginormous, and two, it wasn't covered. So that struck me as a little odd that, you know, normally when you see U.S. consoles, the expansion port is covered. Even when they're used consoles, chances are the expansion port is covered because in the United States, we rarely, if ever, use the expansion port. I think, let's see, the youngest console that I can think of, well, no, not the youngest, the oldest console that I can think of that actually used the expansion port commonly in the United States was the GameCube, and that was for the, uh, oh, I don't even, Super GameCube, or Super Game Boy Advance, or whatever it was called, I actually don't know. So yeah, that struck me as a little odd that it was actually exposed. And I understand why, because looking at the rest of it, there are no standard RCA composite video jacks on this thing. It is just the antenna switch, and that's it. There's nothing else. And it struck me as a little odd, because this was a competitor for the Super Nintendo. It was a fourth-generation console. The NES, the original Nintendo, had a, you know, composite connection. So that struck me as a little odd. But these two things that struck me as odd are actually related, and there's a reason for that, and I can show you on the side of the box here. There are extra little devices that you can ha add to it. There is the Turbo Booster accessory, which actually adds the composite video and stereo jacks. So that means that the RF output is mono, which strikes me as a little odd, but isn't gonna be a problem in this video because all my audio is mono anyways. Uh, it also has the TurboGrafx CD player, which, according to my information, is the first instance of a video game console using CDs. So I'm going to have to get me one of them, because that's an important one. That's an important one right there. So these are all sold separately. So I'm perfectly fine with doing the console as it stands, even though you'll see, like, in like on Wikipedia and in pictures, you always see the back, the turbo booster adapter on the back of it. But this is how it came. It came like this, with this really strange looking protrusion on the back. So let's plug this guy in and take a look at it. Whoop. Plug in the very fat cable that goes for the controller. Now, it wasn't that big of a problem that there was only one controller port. It only meant that you had to buy the four port adapter. There was a, yeah, four port or four pad 
like split that you could plug into this thing that you had to buy separately. So yeah, interesting stuff. So there were multiplayer games. This wasn't a single player only console. There were multiplayer games. It was just that you had to buy an extra accessory, like 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 the Super Nintendo splitter thing, where you could plug in four Super Nintendo controllers and play four player games. That I don't think was very common. Hmm. But I'm sure that was something that developers took in, you know, took into account when they were making their games. Now the games also strike me as fairly interesting. We got this thing here, which looks really weird to me but is the cartridge. This is the game. It is about the size of a credit card, a little tiny thing. It is called a Hue card, which is a very interesting name. Now, this isn't the first console to use cards like this. From what I understand, the Sega Master System used cards like this, but they were extremely rare. To have a console solely around these, well, that's kind of unique, isn't it? Plug you in. Let's turn on. I have a. This is my Emerson CRT TV. I brought this down instead of the uh, Trinitron because the quality is going to be more accurate to the time. Even though this was released in 1989 and this TV was made in 2005. So a little bit of time difference, but I don't have anything more appropriate. So it'll work for me. Uh, boop, turn you on, you're already set to channel 3, wait for the CRT to power up and warm up, there we go, and we turn you on and we get Keith Courage in Alpha Zones. Now I only have this one game for it so far, I've been looking into it, but apparently Turbo Graphic games are kind of expensive. So, it's fairly interesting to me. Now, the Turbo Pro, or no, Turbo Pad, I thought it was Turbo Pro. The letters kind of screw with my head, but it's the Turbo Pad controller struck me as a little odd. It reminds me of the NES controller, except he has these slider switches here. And they seem to be repeater switches. So, uh, if you flip this up and you press and hold the button, it repeats the action over and over again. But if you slide it down the whole way and press the button, it only does the action once. So it actually confused me initially when I was playing the game because they were both set to up initially. So let's run because instead of start, we have run. So run the game and we get something that looks, I don't know. It seems to me to be a blend between Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. Now, I know they were the same generation, but the Sega Genesis always seemed to have better graphics to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it fits with the times. Now, the TurboGrafx-16 was called the TurboGrafx-16 because it was a 16-bit uh, video card, a GPU. It had two of them, in fact. Two 16-bit graphics card, even though the CPU itself was still an 8-bit CPU. And it looks pretty. It really does. And that guy was stuck in the ground. Hmm. Few glitches that I've noticed in this console. Boop. But yeah, the game is fairly interesting. It's very... I don't know. You know those Japanese animes that have the giant robots that fight everything. That's this, <laughs> basically. It is a very giant, you know, oh, what are they called? Oh, the giant Japanese robots. There's a general term for it, but I forget what it is, whoops. But we can see up at the top, I have three life hearts. Now I can go in and actually like go into those buildings and buy stuff, but I have no point to just yet. But here we go with the giant robot thing. You take the rainbow road or whatever it's called, the rainbow path, and you turn into a giant robot with a giant sword that can, that runs really fast. Once you get used to the robot running around, it's kind of hard to get back to uh, the regular dude, the regular guy, this Keith Courage guy, because it just plays different. Whoa. And I'm not doing very good at it, 
But if you notice, I don't know if the resolution on the camera is high enough since it's far enough away. I'm not losing those hearts. It's actually really hard to lose the hearts in the game. But you get them back. But yeah, I mean, the controller seems to be fairly responsive. Um, probably fits around the age of the Super Nintendo. Whoop. Fourth generation. I mean, it, it fits. The technology fits. And what does strike me as kind of odd and makes me wonder things. Nah, nah. I was thinking, there are no, like, death pits in this game. You see, you probably can't very well see because it's red on black, but down here there are spikes. If you don't see those spikes, it's safe to fall down. Like, you can't see underneath right now, but it's safe to fall down because there are no bottomless pits like in Super Mario. And I was about to th think that I wonder if those kind of things had been invented yet, and then it dawned on me. Mario, like, Super Mario Brothers was Nintendo. This is in the era of Super Nintendo, so of course those things had been invented. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's just a very strange, strange game. There's no, like, cutscene dialogue kind of thing, and that's just creepy. It's almost impossible to see these guys in the background. It might actually be able to see it better on the camera, but I doubt it. But they're very creepy, like, mutated, like, half-deformed creatures. And it's just creepy as crap. Oh, and then there's these guys. And I always die fighting these guys, because I never really got down. I'm now losing hearts, finally. You have to take a whole crap ton of beating to lose hearts. There we go. I actually beat it. And now we're on level two. There are seven levels to this game. Oh, it feels so slow walking with this guy now. <laughs> Got used to walking around with, uh... I swear I can go in there. There we go. Oh, yes, there we got Nurse, Nurse Nancy. She can heal me for 400 gold. No, I don't have 400 gold. You are on your way to the reverse zone. Careful. Yeah, the reverse zone is a little weird looking initially but it's not really any different from the rest of the game it's creative though everything's upside down and you're just walking on the on the bottom side of the floating platforms and all the monsters are on the top and i just oh i found my bottomless pit and it's game over <laughs> and it goes back to the start but you can continue from the beginning of the last level you are in so that's a bonus but all your stuff is cut in half so, yeah, fun stuff. Wee. So it's a, it's a fairly interesting game. It controls fairly well. It runs smoothly. I haven't noticed any jittering or... There's that death trap right there. I swear I wasn't this bad the first time I was playing the game. Or at least the first time I made it to the second level. I was pretty bad the first time I played this game. And it's all just... It's a pretty good console. It's, uh, I was expecting slightly less. Um, oh yeah, I already went in here. No, go away. Um, I was expecting less out of this console, because I was used to, uh, you know, I've played the Atari 2600, you know, the, the popular console from the second generation, and then I played the Fairchild Channel F, and it was a noticeable difference between the two. It's, uh, the, the Fairchild Channel F was noticeably lower quality than the 2600. So I was kind of expecting that here, but no. I... Uh, yeah, let's just let it go back to its start. No, just turn that down. And yeah, so it's pretty good for what it is. It's... I don't want to say it's above Super Nintendo because I haven't really played that many games for it, but it looks like it has the potential to be better than the Super Nintendo, depending on how it all worked. I know the Super Nintendo had the ability to add expansion hardware into the cartridges, whereas obviously with the card here, it, you're never going to be able to do that. But it also had the add-ons that it actually used in the United States, like the CD add-on, which added more power to the console. So I don't know. 
uh, I'd have to really play with it more and compare the two, but it seems to have the potential to have been better than the Super Nintendo. It just never caught on in the United States. It caught on in Japan as the PC engine, but it never really caught on in the United States. And those are lucky kitties. I just noticed that <laughs> the, the kitties that are falling down, they're little lucky kitty uh, statues that you can get. Hmm. Alrighty, so that is the TurboGrafx-16. I am impressed with this console. That is not something that I can normally say when it comes to playing with older consoles since I've become used to, you know, modern-day PC gaming and modern-day consoles. But yes, I am truly impressed with the TurboGrafx-16, and I think it should have gotten a better deal when it first came out. So I will see you guys in the next episode, and as always, keep playing the game, and watch out for those bottomless pits.